You know, it's been a long time since I had a chance to talk to you guys. I don't like that very much. I miss you guys. It's now in the middle of summer. It's hot. And we haven't had a chance to hang out, play games, learn lots of cool things, and have fun together. So from Big D, that's me, to you guys. All you guys who are at home right now, I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July with the family. Maybe seen some fireworks, had some sparklers, even maybe swam in a lake or a pool. I miss you, and I'll see you real soon. So keep the smiles going, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye now. Hey, guys. Welcome to another Kid Central Online. As you can probably notice, I'm somewhere different this time than I normally am not when I do these videos. I'm in my backyard, and that is because I want to be outside and soak in this sunshine as much as I can. We've had some beautiful weather, and yes, it's been hot, so I hope you guys have been able to go swimming or run through your sprinkler or do something to cool down. So not only am I in a different place, we're going to do things a little bit differently on our video. Today, we're going to focus on a story that Pastor Dan has started talking about on Sunday mornings. Do you guys know what that story is? Yes, it's Jonah. He has started a series about Jonah and all the things that the book of Jonah in the Bible talks about. So I'm going to share a video with you guys about the book of Jonah. And hopefully you guys will be able to learn some things from that that we can talk about over the next couple of weeks. Another thing that I'm going to do that's a little bit different is share a song with you. And this is not a song that pertains to the memory verse that we are memorizing. It's a song about Jesus. And the reason I'm sharing that song with you guys is because we have learned so many things about Jesus, who he is, and what he has done. We are learning how beautiful Jesus is. And that's exactly what the song talks about. Jesus, we've learned, is the bread of life. When our hearts become hungry or restless, and we're trying to fill our lives with things that make us happy, it doesn't work. It might work for a little while, but ultimately it doesn't satisfy our heart. Only Jesus does. That's why he's called the bread of life. Jesus is the vine from which we, the branches, grow. He has all the nourishment we need to grow, all the strength we need to do what he has called us to do, to produce that fruit that we've talked about, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, peace, gentleness. Jesus is our shepherd. We are like sheep that he tenderly cares for. He loves. And if we start to wander our own way, he finds us and brings us back close to him. He takes care of us and gives us what we need. Those are some of the things we've talked about this year. So this song is a reminder about how beautiful Jesus is. What a beautiful name, the name of Jesus. So first, we're going to do our memory verse before we get to the song and the story. Are you guys remembering the memory verse? I hope so. So I'm going to leave out a couple of those words, and I want you guys to fill in the words as I'm saying the verse. The verse is found in Matthew 11, verse 29. Here goes. Take my upon you. Let me you, for I am 
and of heart and you will find for your souls. All right, let's say it together and see if you got those words right. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. For I am humble and gentle of heart and you will find rest for your souls. Great job, you guys. All right, we are gonna move on to the story about Jonah, and then the song will be at the end. You guys can get up and sing the song out loud if you're at home, or you can just listen to it and think about all of those verses we've talked about this year about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Think about how he is so beautiful and he has surrounded us in creation with his beauty. His artwork is on display for us to see. The Book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. Let's just dive in and we'll see how all the pieces work together. The story opens as God addresses Jonah and commissions him to go preach against the evil and injustice in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, Israel's bitter enemy. But instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction, finding a ship going as far west as you can go to Tarshish. Now the big question here is why? Why does Jonah run? Is he afraid? Does he just not like Ninevites? And we're not told yet. So the man of God tries to run from God, and he boards a ship full of pagan sailors. He goes down into the ship, and then he falls asleep. So God sends a huge storm to wake up his prophet, while ironically the sailors above board are wide awake to everything that's happening. They can discern that there's a divine power at work here. So they throw the dice, and they discover that Jonah, he is the culprit. So they asked Jonah to explain himself, and Jonah spouts off a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. He says, yeah, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the dry land. What a joke, right? God made the sea and the dry land all right, and Jonah's dumb enough to run from this God by getting on a boat? And when the sailors asked Jonah what they should do, he says, kill me, right, by throwing me overboard, which kind of seems noble at first until you realize this could actually be his most selfish move yet. I mean, what better way to avoid going to Nineveh? So he puts his blood on these innocent sailors' hands by trying to force them to kill him. They're reluctant, of course, and they repent to God even as they toss him over. The storm subsides, and they end up fearing the God of Israel, and unlike Jonah, they actually worship God. But God foils Jonah's plans to escape Nineveh. As Jonah's sinking, God provides this strange, watery tomb for him, the stomach of a large fish. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, this would be certain death. But in this story, everything's upside down. And so Jonah's submarine death becomes his passage back to life. Cramped in the stomach of this beast, Jonah utters a prayer, where he never technically says that he's sorry, but he does thank God for not abandoning him, and he promises that he will obey God from this point on, no matter what. And God's response is quite comic. The whale vomits Jonah back onto dry land. So once again, God commissions Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah complies. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city. It would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in, and here is his message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now, his sermon is very short, and it's also odd. I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong, or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive 
than God's own prophet. So God forgives the Ninevites and he doesn't bring destruction on the city. Now, here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah, he's fuming mad, and he utters his second prayer. He first tells God why he ran away back in chapter 1. It was not because he was afraid. Rather, it was because he knew that God was so merciful. And this is great. Jonah actually quotes God's own description of himself from the book of Exodus, and he throws it back in God's face as an insult. He says he knew that God is compassionate and that you would find some way to forgive these horrible Ninevites. You can just hear the disgust in Jonah's voice. Jonah then cuts off the conversation and he prays that God would kill him on the spot. He'd rather die than live with the God who forgives his enemies. Fortunate for Jonah, God doesn't comply and simply asks if Jonah's anger is even justified. Jonah ignores the question and he goes outside the city to camp on a nearby hill, waiting to see what might happen. You know, the Ninevites might repent of their repentance and get roasted after all. What happens next is very odd. God provides this viney plant to shade Jonah from the sun, and that makes him quite happy. But then God sends a tiny worm to eat up the plant, and so Jonah loses his shade. And there, in the heat of the sun, Jonah asks again that God kill him. So God, again, asks Jonah if his anger is justified, and Jonah barks back, absolutely just let me die. And those are Jonah's last words in the story. God's final words are what concludes the book. He says that this whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah, right? Jonah got all concerned and emotional over this vine, which he only enjoyed for a day. And God asked Jonah, you know, aren't humans a bit more valuable than vines? I mean, isn't it okay if God might feel the same kind of emotion and concern for the city of Nineveh that's full of thousands of people who have lost their way and also their cows? And that's how the book ends with God asking Jonah for permission to show mercy to his enemies. And what is Jonah's answer? The story doesn't say, because that's not the point. The point is that the book is trying to mess with you. And God's questions here are actually addressed to you, the reader. Are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemy? And so this book holds a mirror up to the one who reads it. In Jonah, we see the worst parts of our own character magnified, which should generate humility and gratitude that God would love his enemies and put up with the Jonah in all of us. And so this strange story actually becomes a message of good news about the wideness of God's mercy that ought to challenge us to the core. And that's the book of Jonah.